So yeah, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, being here at this event. Hope you'll get some good uh, mileage out of it for yourselves. Uh, we know uh, time is very, very precious, and we're all very pleased that you chose to spend your time today with all of us, so uh, thank you. Um, today's topic will uh, look at uh, zone circs versus zone valves, um, and look at a couple of different things and uh, um, see how they uh, hold up against another. Um, it is a conversation that's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, and those con uh, conversations continue uh, to happen. And uh, there's really, uh, without uh, giving it all away here, but there's really no right or wrong. But we'll just look at a couple of different examples. But it's just like this conversation here in terms of the toilet papers, right? Is it the over or the under? You know, most folks will say, well, it's always the over. Well, that's until you have a house full of kids or pets that uh, like to play with things and quickly you turn into an under kind of guy or person. So, um, but really there's no right or wrong. So why zone with circulators? Actually, before I even go there, um, and the lights are pretty bright so I can see so well, but um, um, just by show of hands, how many of you prefer to zone by pumps? See a few, perfect. Anybody that prefers to zone with valves? Also some. Again, goes to show there's um, positive influences on uh, either side. So the question is, why use zone circulators? Well, why not? What you get with zone circulators is some reliability, redundancy, and also the sizing um, uh, obviously comes into play. So let's look at a couple of these. So what does it mean in terms of uh, reliability? We see across the country, roughly, uh, we see zone circs outpacing zone valves, roughly two to one. It really depends on where you're at. Like you go into some areas in the United States, as an example, in New England, um, there you would probably see four or five to one uh, zone pumps versus zone valves. And then it seems that the further west you go, folks tend to go more towards valves. So there's that piece. Now, uh, zone circulate also in terms of reliability, um, and it doesn't really matter which manufacturer you go with, uh, they're all quality products out there, and those are all designed and developed and built to last a long, long time. Um, what uh, some engineers might use to, um, uh, uh, to develop the product is a life cycle of uh, as much as 18 years. Um, roughly, a circulator in this case would uh, um, run at roughly 250,000 cycles. The 250,000 uh, cycles number comes over the course of 18 years, assuming that we're running about uh, six months of the year uh, for heating. And uh, when you do the math backwards, it should work out to roughly about three cycles per hour, um, which uh, ironically also coincides with some of the energy code requirements that you'll see in Europe that will eventually probably make their way into North America as well. But here again, the product, um, there, there's uh, reliable, 18 years is, is, is something that some of the product managers might use to develop a product for, but we know that there are circulators out there that have been running much, much longer than that. Um, so that gives you some comfort uh, in zoning with circulators. Talking about long life, uh, here we see a couple of circulators. Wet rotor circulators have been around since the 60s. You know, it's a long time now, 60 years. Um, and there's a couple that you see in the picture, those were installed in the early 60s that are still running to this day. So, you know, we know that a lot of these products can far outlast the uh, 18 years that uh, they were actually designed for. So there's a lot of comfort in the dependability uh, of, of this sort of product today. So basically, don't get excited, it's nothing new, it's been working, tried, proven and tested. Um, it's a great uh, product um, to service our systems with. Now, redundancy also. If you had, as an example, one zone or one system pump in a system, and then you do your zone with uh, valves, you're zoning with valves, if for whatever reason that one pump were to fail, the whole system is down. So when you zone with pumps, again, when, if one were to fail, in the highly unlikely event of an emergency over water or <laughs> in the hydronic systems, you still got enough 
uh, zones in the building that could keep it warm. So that speaks to the redundancy aspect. This uh, presentation was to get, uh, put together by one of our friends in the US. They, uh, the, they uh, like uh, their guns, so here they said, hey, if you could have a single gun, well, it works, but more guns are better, right? So fair enough. Same thing with zone valves, it's, uh, or zone pumps is what the uh, message here is. We talked about this again. If one circ were to go down, you're just losing the heat in that particular zone. So it gives you that level of redundancy. Now, also when it comes to sizing, when you put a pump on a zone, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to get the flow that you're going to need for that particular zone. In fact, many smaller hydronic residences, um, a zone uh, with as much of a three-quarter inch pipe, if you had to go slightly bigger, you could, but in many cases, the most common wet rotor circulator you can um, uh, get in your market, and it doesn't matter if it's one of ours or any of the other guys, is those are very common components that are generally um, typically available everywhere. Most folks will have them on the truck as well when it comes to a service requirement. But when you zone with pumps, any little wet rotor circulator can pretty much achieve the job for any zone uh, that you're uh, pumping. And even if it is slightly on the low end, next model up will get it done guaranteed. So it always gives you that comfort that you get the flow where you need it and when. Also, wiring has come a long way, and you'll see a lot of the great uh, control vendors here. Um, please go see them. But um, there are wiring convenience boxes available now today that make the wiring nightmare go away. Simple uh, thermostat connections on the top, as you'll see in this example. Your low voltage connections, call for heat comes in. Internal relays will then switch the power to the 120 volt circulator. So even the wiring is um, made pretty simple and straightforward these days. Um, but that is true if you're doing zone pumps or zone valves. Here's an example of a uh, job that looks rather uh, interesting. I think you've seen a couple of those uh, similar pictures in uh, Siggy's presentation this morning. But here in this case, the, the, the subject line says, zone valves just plain suck. Well, that's not true either. <laughs> so let's look at using zone valves. Why would we uh, use zone valves? Well, why not? They're still reliable. They also provide easy wiring and ease of uh, maintenance. And they can take up less space. And they can be much lower in terms of energy consumption, operating costs. So these are the things that we want to consider. Um, and again, for every job, you want to decide what is it that we want to provide the customer with. The redundancy might cost a little bit more to operate or the most uh, energy efficient uh, type of system. So in terms of reliability, again, we said pumps may fail, don't they? Well, very rarely they do, but if they did, um, again, they're typically available everywhere. Um, components typically, the length of the life uh, cycle they have, typically uh, is a function of how many cycles you run it through. Um, so uh, we learned earlier about the circulators, for example, 250,000 cycles is what a lot of these have been designed and developed for, but they can far exceed them. But the point here is that the more you turn something on and off, the shorter its lifetime is, can be expected it can be. So in a system, as, as an example, and that's true, but it's its own level, its own pump, really, all uh, based on life cycles, but how can we how can we control the number of cycles we might have in a system? Is there other things we could do? And again, I want to point to some of the control manufacturers that are out here on the floor. Uh, please go see them. But water temperature control in your hydronic heating system is very important. If you can match the water temperature to the building heat loss, then you can reduce the number of cycles. So, you know, we can get away when, you know, outdoor reset as an example. When it's not the coldest day of the year, we can reduce the water temperature in order to keep the systems on longer and therefore reduce short cycling or multiple cycles. Then, in this particular example, though, the argument is if a pump fails, there could be no heat in the whole building. Yes, again, it's a possibility. But circulators as a whole, and again, it doesn't matter who man which manufacturer you go with, 
they're pretty darn reliable. Very, very few uh, will go down, and if they do, again, in many cases, uh, they're easily accessible for replacement. However, building a ball full of circulars, it does look nice, don't it? We love it, it looks nice. But, um, again, it doesn't always have to be as such. So, we, uh, you heard Siggy talk about that this morning. Um, our industry is still relatively small in the big scheme of things when we look at new home construction. Um, we have a great opportunity to capitalize on that, but the reality is if we want to capitalize on that, we have to make the systems affordable, number one, repeatable, and available uh, to just about everybody. And we can only achieve that if we design the buildings in such a manner where we keep them simple. So here's an example of, uh, you know, this, this, this could be a 20, 30,000 square foot mansion, might need that number of zones. But in a, a typical residence, you might not need 10. We have the flexibility that we can zone with hydronic systems, but it doesn't mean we have to go all on and, and zone every room separately, right? Let's, Let's, let's find a medium ground somewhere where we can offer the flexibility, but keep the cost uh, of the system as a, as a whole, uh, low as much as possible, um, and, and still uh, provide great systems. That is what will grow our industry as a whole. If we start thinking that way and we make things easier, cheaper, and repeatable uh, for the consumer, that's when we will grow. But also uh, in this picture, you'll see that if you use zone circulators, often, you, you require a little bit more space than you would need if you were to size with zone wells. Zone wells can be more compact and you can therefore perhaps utilize a smaller amount of real estate in order to get the job done. Here's an example, similar example, similar number of zones, but you see it quite a bit more compact um, in the mechanical room. So if space is an issue, which unfortunately often seems to be the case, um, you know, Buildings are very well developed, uh, designed, and, 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 and planned, um, except for the one thing that sometimes gets forgotten is the mechanical room. And somebody at the end goes, it's like, hey, where are we going to put all this stuff? And somebody goes, oh, man, I <laughs> forgot about that. Mechanical room. So if space uh, is a limita limiting factor, zone wells might give you an opportunity to get the space down a little bit. Now let's look at a couple of different zone wells, and there are different types, and it's important to um, understand what types of zone wells that you're using in your systems because they'll have a different impact on the overall energy profile, I guess, or the energy consumption uh, that may go along with it. Um, so we're just going to pick on our own uh, because there's also different valves. Uh, here's a, a, a thermal motor type zone valves that uh, we've had available for a long, long time. Um, the CV of that particular valve is about 6.1. Um, you'll find that there's uh, different types of zone valves on the market, ones with very small orifices in the center of it, typically have a lower CV, therefore a higher pressure drop, that we need to consider when we look at the overall energy consumption of the system. But this particular valve, when you put it in line with the zone, you would add roughly about uh, a, a pressure drop that's equivalent to about 20 feet of pipe. Not a big deal because you can account for it, but of course, in this particular case, a zone valve with a small orifice adds that resistance to it that we need to overcome. At the end of the day, a zone valve is really a restrictor um, of flow. Also, when you use zone valves, um, how can you guarantee what the actual flow is that will go through the zone? Unless you put another means of balancing in there, you cannot really guarantee what the flow is that you'll get through that zone. But in most cases, hydronic being as forgiving and flexible as it is, typically it, it, it's not a very critical component. But it can be. But now let's look at different types of zone valves. Now those are ones that are typically uh, using a little uh, ball. They're basically motorized ball valves, if you so will. And when you look at the inside of it, you'll find that they almost have a full port, full, full flow. So what that means is there's a lot less restriction going through these. And you want to be mindful of that when you, again, think of designing your systems and, and, and looking at the overall energy profile that this building runs at. So a ball valve type zone valve could have a CV, as is in this case, um, of a 10.2. So it's a much higher CV, meaning we can put a greater flow rate through it with a, with a less restric uh, restriction through it. 
a quick uh, picture of uh, one of those valves uh, side by side. On the left hand side, you'll see one of those zone valves with a small orifice. And then on the right hand side, you'll see a uh, example of a zone valve that uh, uses a ball valve, or in this case, it's a, it's a plunger. But in many cases, there's, there's a much greater orifice in it, giving you less restriction through it. So how do we calculate the additional head loss? We basically take the flow, divide that by the CV value, squared, and then we times that number by 2.31, which will convert that number into feet of head resistance, which you would then add to your head loss. So in reality, when you do zoning with zone wells, pay attention to the CV, because that will have an impact on your system. So looking at a small example, 28,000 BTUs uh, an hour uh, for a zone, um, in this case, the flow divided by C, uh, CV squared times 2.31 will give you that added head loss. So let's plug in some of these numbers. So 28,000 BTUs at 2.8 GPM, uh, sorry, at the 20 uh, degree delta T uh, equals 2.8 gallons per minute. So we'll take the 2.8 gallons per minute divided by the CV of 10.2 squared, and that number will be 0 0.8 PSI, which is your additional pressure drop. Uh, when you equate that uh, the, uh, times 2.31, that's your 0.18 feet of head, which is almost negligible. So if you looked at the system, in this case, if, if you had uh, um, five feet of head resistance through that particular zone, you add the zone valve to it, very minor amount, negligible, it would be 5.3 uh, feet that, that, uh, that we now need to overcome in order to flow the, the fluid through the system or through that zone. Now, how much would that number vary if you had a zone valve that had a smaller orifice in it? Resistance would go up, and therefore also your overall power consumption will go up as well. So again, in this case, we're using one of the lower, zone, uh, lower power consumption zone valves, its entire CV uh, uh, values um, out there to kind of show the difference of the two more dramatically. But of course, if you have a High, a lower CV valve, the difference will become a little bit less. So electrical savings with uh, zone valves. If we did zoning with pumps with traditional um, constant speed um, wet rotor circulators, they draw anywhere between 80 to 85 watts roughly. Um, if, if you got five of them, that'll work. Times 85 watts is 425 watts. So let's look how we uh, run in terms of operating costs. If you take that 425 watts and divide it by 1,000 to come up with kilowatts, that comes out to 0 0.43 kilowatts. Now you take that number and you times that by the average on hours, and then that will give you the total of kilowatt hours uh, consumed by that particular example. 2,500 is an average that uh, uh, an association of electrical appliances um, estimated. It's a fixed value that we use in this case for the, the two different comparisons, but be mindful of the fact that that could change um, in your particular markets or, or, or your particular conditions and, and systems. So when you take that kilowatt hour number times the current electrical rate, which 17 cents is pretty average, I think, here for Ontario, but of course we're very mindful of the fact that that changes across the country depending on where you're at. Just use your electrical rate, plug it in its place. But in this case, we're running with the 17 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, this five zone system would roughly cost us $183 a year to run in terms of um, uh, running the circulators. Now let's look at the same example with uh, zone valves. Now we have one circulator that runs at 85 watts, but now we have five zone valves instead of uh, five zone pumps. At 1.44 watt each, we're only talking about 92.2 watts. Times uh, divided by 1,000 to give us the uh, kilowatt. And then take that times the same 2,500 uh, on hours, and that'll equate to 230 kilowatt hours. At that same electrical rate, now we're $39. So what do we have, 180 something, 183 operating dollars? And we now just drop that down to $40. So the difference is 
not insignificant, but it's also not staggering, right? Like, uh, you know, most of us um, enjoy, uh, <laughs> I know my wife is an example, not to pick on her, but you know what, we'll spend more than that at Starbucks a month. <laughs> the difference here, but anyway, it's not insignificant. So now, if we go with some of the more modern or technology available today, ECM uh, circulators, as a, as a matter of fact, they even draw a whole lot less. Now, your five uh, zone pump example could go down to 100 watts, and that only costs you 4250. So now the difference between using zone pumps versus zone valves is even become less. Now, let's do it again. Let's use the super ECM circulators available today and do it with zone valves as well. Now, of course, they can now vary the speed of its output to match more the, 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 the load in the system. If you have a traditional on-off circulator, if any one of those zone valves is on, whether it's one, two, three, or five, that pump is on in a constant speed circ. When you do, uh, run it with an ECM circulator, it can now actually respond to the load changes in the building, and if only one valve is open, it'll reduce the output of that circulator. But on average, we'll, we'll do that same equation using the 20 watts, uh, and uh, calculate that out. So now, one ECM circulator, only using 20, so about a quarter of what the traditional on-off circulator would have used. Add the uh, zone valves uh, power consumption to it, and how the math works out at 17 cents, now we're talking 12, less than $12 to run that system. So less than a buck a month to run a hydronic system. This is pretty impressive, I think, compared to what we had originally in the earlier days with on-off circs, so that was 180 bucks. Also the wiring. Uh, the wiring is uh, pretty straightforward. The wiring convenience uh, box is available for zone valves similar to those on the pumps, except for now there is no line voltage that you need to switch through them because we're using 24 volt zone valves. Same applies here, low voltage thermostat connection on the top, signals to call for heat in that zone, power is switched then now uh, to the zone valve to open it up, uh, and then an end switch is what would turn on uh, a circulator. And again, if it's an on-off circulator, constant speed, it's always 100% on, 100% off. Um, but if you use an ECM circulator these days, they can operate their output based on uh, resistance in the system. So again, it makes the wiring easier. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter which way you go, especially with today's technology. Uh, they can both be very uh, cost effective in terms of operation. I think it really comes down to what is it that your customer might be looking for that you uh, want to provide them with. Example being, like, you know, those 20,000 square foot villas. Not so sure that the uh, operating costs are the driving factors there. There they just want the heat when they want it, on and off. Zone pumps would probably always be the way that you would choose to go, or in many cases in those applications. Or if a job is, let's say, far away from your home office, again, you get that little bit of redundancy when you use zone, uh, zone pumps. But um, zone valves also work. They work extremely well, and they can further minimize the overall operating cost. So at the end of the day, there really is no right or wrong. It really comes down to what your preference is, and the products available today on the market are able to give you very cost-effective solutions um, any which way you go in terms of operating costs. So, a couple of other slides that uh, my colleague added in here. Why do we do things like this? Well, why do we put 30 circulators on a, on a, on a, on a system? You know, like, keeping in mind uh, and going along with something Siggy mentioned this morning, only because we can have 30 zones in a 30-room type of building doesn't mean we have to do it, right? Um, if your customer absolutely desires and, and asks for that, of course. But really, again, um, we, we sort of share also a bit of a responsibility as the hydronics guys that uh, offer the feedback to the uh, consumer. You know, we should, we should be able to at least talk to them about the pros and cons and, and, and why it might make sense to um, not do 30 zones, maybe group a couple of bedrooms together, whatever, reduce the number of zones. 
uh, to keep the system more simple and uh, more straightforward. <laughs> also, the way systems can be installed uh, you know, in the early days, this is a, 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 a real tough example of a very tough job that's gone in. And uh, you know, Siggy mentioned that also earlier this morning. When you go into troubleshoot a job, how do you begin to troubleshoot something like this, right? Um, wiring, we see there's not even any labels or anything there. Everything is just wire nutted together. Again, trying to keep the, the systems simpler and more straightforward and cleaner by using some of the aids and uh, tools that are available to us today, like zone controls, right? It keeps things much more uh, straightforward. Point-to-point -point wiring, it's easier to troubleshoot, walk in, often you'll got the error codes or indicator lights associated with it that'll make it easier to troubleshoot it. Um, again, uh, just trying to make things simpler. Now, that's really the last slide almost. Um, again, we just wanted to summarize that, you know, only because we can do things overly exciting and, and complicated, like, you know, we're, we're really hydronics geeks, we like to do a, explore every, everything we can offer with it, like, you know, go nuts with zoning and, and add complexity to things. But it, ultimately speaking, it's good for us because we know what we're doing, I guess, in many cases, but it's really scaring off some of the consumers and end users. So um, really, my plea would be uh, to, uh, uh, to, to all you folks out there that when you discuss these sort of systems with your consumers, you know, try to, try to keep things more simple, I guess, and more repeatable. And, and, and as a whole, I think that will move our industry forward uh, together a whole lot more. So maybe in the future, we may not be three or 5% of the new home construction. We want to get that to 10, 15, or 20, or maybe eventually, maybe even see it to hit levels like we do in Europe, where every home has got hydronic heating in it. But that's all I had in this particular presentation. So I'd like to thank you for that. I hope there was some value you got from it. Um, but by all means, uh, you know, myself and Sean will be around here all day. If there's anything we can uh, do to uh, help or discuss with you, by all means, please stop by and see us. Awesome. Thank you.